Once again, do you know what you just prayed in these songs, All just virtually all these songs? You know, a good thing to do at the end of a service, maybe through the week, you could uh, take your bullet, first off, take your bulletin home with you. Don't leave it here. <laughs> we just toss them in the garbage. They don't do us any good. They've got a prayer list. You can pray for them. But take the hymns, look them up online, and read the words again, and ponder the words. Listen to this refrain from our opening hymn. Shine, Jesus, shine. You all love that hymn, I know, because I know the way you sing it. You love it. So, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. You want to know how God's going to let Jesus shine? You want to know how the Father's glory is going to be manifest? It's going to be setting our hearts on fire, every one of us continues flow river flow flood the nations with grace and mercy how's he going to do that yeah, yeah. send forth your word how's he yeah how's he going to do that <laughs> through us through you and me every one of us send forth your word lord and let there be light that's, that's part of our calling. That's part of what Pentecost is really all about. I could go, well, I am going to go on a little bit more about that today. How many of you were here last year in the month of May uh, and um, into June a little bit? When we, for those of you here, does, does that ring a bell with anybody, what we did kind of special last year? Well, Father Bill was here on the 29th, yeah, uh-huh. It was part of a series. It was part of a series. Do you remember that? The Holy Spirit. There you go, Joyce. Thank you. Life in the Spirit seminar. We had seven, seven weeks of teaching on the Holy Spirit culminating on, I think it was Trinity Sunday. We're going to celebrate Trinity Sunday next week, but it was on Trinity Sunday where uh, Bill was here. I, I was here. Also, uh, Deacon Peg was here uh, from, a different, from another congregation, to, and we ministered. We, we laid hands on everybody, and we prayed for the Holy Spirit to come uh, as you were I've wondered this past week, for those of us who have looked at our lives since then that were here, or, or maybe heard about it, and, and whether you were here and had the hands laid on you or not, uh, but you heard about it, you thought about it, you prayed about it, you prayed for the Holy Spirit to come again afresh and anew all over, which Paul talks about is, is a good thing to do in the book of Ephesians, he talks about that. But how many of you, is there anybody who would care to share, yeah, I've seen a change in my life that I think is a good change. Uh, about my faith. Anybody have anything at all that they would share that uh, that maybe occurred in their lives in this past year? Maybe, maybe it happened right there on the morning that we prayed and laid hands on you, but maybe it happened days, weeks, months later. You begin to see a little bit of a change. Anything at all? Okay. Well, that's, God is still continuing to change us. All of us, regardless of where we are in, in our relationship with Christ, whether we're brand new or we've been in a relationship with Jesus for decades upon decades, He's continuing to change us. That was one of the topics that talked about at our uh, Bible study here uh, this morning, uh, which adult ed is, as, as uh, we finished up adult ed, and we'll pick it up again uh, later in, in the summer, probably in, in August. But pay attention to what the Holy Spirit might be doing. Pay attention, pay close attention. You know, last week was the Feast of the Ascension, and we, we read at Scripture from earlier in Acts. Uh, um, Ken just read from Acts chapter 2, the first uh, passage. But you remember, if you, especially if you were here last week, you'll remember that the, according to this passage in Acts chapter 1, the last words that Jesus spoke to his apostles to the 11 uh, before uh, he ascended was, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Power. Power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end, end of the earth. And then they, they waited. He ascended. They, they went back to Jerusalem, and they waited for 10 days, it turned out that they waited. What were they doing during that waiting? Well, it wasn't read last week. It wasn't read today. But if you look at the verse 14 of chapter 1, it reads this. 
And all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. So, so they all went back and they devoted themselves to prayer, to prayer. You know, whenever you face a, a, a need or a decision that you need to make, you need to give yourself a, a season, I'll use that term very loosely, a season of prayer, because you need to seek the mind of Christ. You need to seek his face. You need to seek his guidance and his direction. And he will, he may make that, that quickly, make it clear, and he may take some time. He may take some time. But they devoted themselves to prayer. And this week, obviously, we come to Pentecost. The disciples, again, were, as it says in a passage, the passage that Ken read, they were telling of the mighty works of God. You know, a lot of times we come to this passage and we emphasize the thing about tongues. You know, tongues is a side thing. Much as I, I agree, you were asked if I was going to speak in tongues today. I said, well, we'll see, see what the Spirit does. But that's a side thing. They were telling of the mighty acts of of God, which in a word is the what? Gospel. It's the gospel. They were telling. So what's the goal of Pentecost? What's the goal of all of this? I mentioned goals last week. We were also not only celebrating Ascension, we, we acknowledged our graduates. I, I challenged them. What's your goal in life? But it was applicable to every single one of us. What's your goal in life. And the goal in this episode right here, pick up your bulletin for a second, because it doesn't look to me like anybody's got your Bibles open to Acts chapter 2, but look at, the, look at the last verse. It's on page 3 of your bulletin right here, Acts chapter 2. This is what still Peter is quoting from the book of Joel, and it reads, and it shall come to pass that, listen to this, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you think that's important to God? That everyone given the opportunity to call on the name of the Lord and thereby they be saved? Absolutely. <laughs> that's the whole point of Pentecost. I want to get that clear to across to us. The point of Pentecost is not to remember something that happened to the church a long time ago. If the Pentecost doesn't happen to the church today, guess what? We're toast and the world is toast. That doesn't mean you ha everybody has to speak in tongues. It doesn't mean everybody has to do this thing or that thing, but we all have to be working towards propagating the gospel to the world. And we may do that with our mouth. I hope if, if God op opens a, an opportunity to, to us to proclaim the gospel, the truth of the gospel, that we don't shrink away. We don't think, well, who am I? Yeah, God, you're the anointed person of God at that moment and that time and that situation to proclaim the gospel. It's you. It's not somebody else. You know, the book of Esther. You know, one of the... the best phrases that comes out of that book for such a time as this. Do you all know what that phrase means? The book of Esther, if you're not familiar with the book of Esther, go read it this week. She risked her life. It was, she was facing, the, the Jewish people were facing annihilation as a whole group of people. And she was called to go into the king and tell him what's going on. Now, going into the king in her time without being summoned by the king was grounds for immediate execution. doesn't matter that you were the queen, anybody. So she took it, her life in her own hands, said, I'm going to, for just such a time as this. This is what her, I think it was her uncle said to her, for just such a time as this, you've been put here. Well, don't think the things that happen in your life just happen. A lot of things will happen because God wanted you to be there at that time to deal with, to in, encounter with the people that you're going to encounter at that time and in the power and presence of His Spirit. Not just, oh, well, it's just part of life. That's the way life goes. Think of it that way. What's it say? that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
You might want to take out a pen or a pencil and underline that to be saved. You know, in our passage from uh, 1 Corinthians 12, it talks about gifts are given to every member of the body. And why? For the common good, for the common good of the church, for the building up of the church. Why? So the church can be more adept, let me use that word, more, more powerful, more, more in tune with, again, propagating the gospel. I said, you don't have to all be speaking in tongues, but you might be one that God calls on to work through and produce a miracle, produce healing, bring healing to somebody. We had a former member passed away right about a year ago. Remember, Jim Zeller sat over there next to Tom. And he has had, for a season in his life, he had the ministry of, of praying for people with one leg shorter than the other. And he literally, as he held on numerous times people's legs, he saw one get longer in his own eyes. And then for a season, that, that, that stopped. That's the way can, God can work. God can work. The goal of all this, to be saved, for building up the body of Christ, the church, for building up, and it may be that your gift is administration. We could have gone all the way through the rest of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, gone all the way, all, all the way into, into uh, uh, the 14th chapter. Your, your gift might be, and I've asked many times, do you know what your spiritual gifts are? Uh, uh, and if you don't, I'll ask it again. Find out. You can ask, but but at any rate, could be, you know, helps. Could be service, could be administration, it could be whatever. There's numerous gifts that are specifically listed in the scriptures, but I do not believe those are exhaustive lists. Power of the Holy Spirit. My devotion this morning, you know, you know, it's really something when the Lord brings together numerous things for this the the, the, the standard, you know, the the, the message. This morning was 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 to 18. I'm going to read it. It won't take long. It's only three, par four paragraphs, two paragraphs. What am I saying? Paul's talking about the ministry of the Holy Spirit and its relationship to the ministry of, of the law, Old Testament law. Listen to this. Now, if the ministry of death, that means that which was carved in, it says carved in letters on stone. He's talking about the Ten Commandments. Have you ever thought about the Ten Commandments as being a ministry of death? Might, stri might strike us a little bit, but the, the whole purpose of the Ten Commandments, and I know we do them often here, yeah, it's something to strive for, but if you're really serious about striving for them, you're going to realize pretty quickly, I can't do this. God, help me. That's the, that's the ministry of death. Die to self and help us to understand that we can't do this. On our own, we have to have God do it for us. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, I'll say, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Does the Holy Spirit have glory in the church today? I think it does have it some places, sometimes. It needs it more. I'm going to tell you it needs it more. For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who put a veil, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end, but their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. If you're not familiar with this story about Moses coming down from the mountain, his face was aglow. 
and everything. Go back and find it in the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus. Read it and study it and see. And then come back here to this passage in 2 Corinthians 3 and see and ponder what Paul, the point what Paul was making again. And he says, he talks about a veil. Their minds were being, being hardened. Okay, where did I leave off? Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. Why? But they haven't come to Christ. That's why. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Free, I'm going to interject. Freedom from fear. Freedom from unsurety. <laughs> freedom from confusion. Freedom from uh, impotence in being a disciple. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. That's a sequence. Are being transformed. Not have been transformed in our completeness, but are being transformed, okay, into the same image. From one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. That's why I ask the Spirit, says the Spirit continually transforms us, continually brings about a change. Okay, Andy, we've gotten to this point. Let's push the envelope a little bit more. Okay, Hal. Okay, Robert. Okay, put your name in there. We got to this point. Let's push it a little bit more. We're saved by grace. We are saved by grace, but we are sanctified sanctified by the work of the Holy Spirit and our cooperation with that Spirit as He moves, moves through us, moves through us. So think about again, if you think about that change, have you experienced a change, especially if you've never been prayed for before last year, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon you in power? If that was new to you, look and see if there was some sort of change since then. I bet it's been there. You just haven't maybe noticed it. You know, the passage, again, from Acts says, to be saved. To be saved. All of our music. Peter was talking about, talking about gossiping the gospel. Gossiping the gospel. Let me ask you this. What kind of an interest do you have as an individual to share the gospel? I'm not saying do you do it well. Do you do it as good as Billy Graham or anything like that? I'm just saying do you have an interest? Do you want to do better? Do you want to do more? Well, make that a prayer. Lord, help me to do better. Help me to want to, if you, if you haven't even thought about, about that. You know, again, I mentioned, Esther, what keeps us from, from doing, you know, a lot of times it's fear. Esther was one, overcame her fear. Think about Moses. Moses went into Pharaoh, overcame his fear. He put up all kinds of excuses with God when God said, I'm sending you back. He said, but, but, uh, but, 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 but. He says, I don't care. <laughs> I tell you what, I'll, I'll, send your, I'll, I'll send Aaron along with you. But ultimately Moses went. Moses went. Do you think David was a little bit scared when he went up against Goliath? I tell you, I didn't do anything like going up against Goliath last, when, uh, what was it, Monday night? Yeah. If you listen to that, you could hear the fear in my, <laughs> in my voice. You could hear it very clearly. And that's nothing about what we're talking about here. But still, it helps us. Paul. Paul had to stand in front of Felix, the governor, and he was on his way to address Caesar. Those people, I bet they had some fear, but they overcame their fear. They moved forward and they addressed kings. You and I have the power to address kings. Things that we might see as kings on the earth. You know, in, in Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, Paul talks about putting on the armor of God. He says in that passage, wrestle not against principalities and powers, but against rulers of the heavenly places. That word rulers means, in a sense, the, the big dogs uh, of what's ruling and who's ruling, the big dogs. Do you think we need, we need the Holy Spirit for us to stand up to the big dogs in our life, whoever that may be? Whatever that may be, absolutely. They were, the, they were the top guys that he's talking about. And so we get, we get, you get incredible power and authority because the Holy Spirit resides in you. Jesus himself resides in you if you have committed your life to Christ. You remember 
when Jesus sent out the 72, they, they sent him out, gave he, something he said to them, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. You think he meant just literal serpents, snakes, literal scorpions? I don't. I did, I did look up in some commentaries. I came across one commentary that did say that. It was just meant for them at, their, at that time. I don't believe that for a second. I went to another commentary, and he agreed with me, so I know he was right. <laughs> I said, serpents sends our mind right back to Genesis chapter 3. You know what happened in Genesis chapter 3? The serpent. The serpent shows up. Adam and Eve, well, you know the rest of the story. If you don't, go check that one out too. Serpents. We can go before kings. We can go before anybody that we might think has a lot more authority than we do because Jesus lives in us. We can live strong. We can live confidently. We can live powerfully. We can live authoritatively for Christ. And does our culture not need to see people, hear people, know people like that? It's been, been, been being said for decades now, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. It's only because the church needs to speak up just a little bit more. Fear, but not also. I'm going to start to wind down a little bit. I'm not going to say I'm going to end, but, but I'm going to wind down a little bit. The other thing that happens is uh, in a culture in which we live, the thing that keeps us from doing it is from being, you know, this strong, this Holy Spirit dependent is, uh, I was, in a word, materialism. Yeah, we already touched on fear, but, but materialism is, is another thing. You know, advertising is a, is a great tool, but you know what advertising is designed to do is to get you and me want what they are selling. That's it. That's all. That's it. It doesn't matter whether you need it or not. And when you think about the national debt of this country, I think that there's no other metric that we can point to other than that one, I think, that shows that we live in a materialistic culture. We live. You know, I read recently a story about a woman, a rich woman from Pompeii. You know Pompeii? You know what Pompeii is? You know, that's that, that city over in southern Italy on the coast um, was hit by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in August of 79, I think it was, 79 AD. The entire town was wiped out, other towns too, wiped out. And it happened so quickly. People literally had to start running, running out of the city, running for the uh, for their boats to get to get out of town and stuff like that. The city was buried under this ash, and in the 1700s they started to ex excavate in there, and it was incredible what they found. They found families in their homes still stuck there. They thought they were going to be safe in their homes. And even after the ash stopped, uh, a poisonous gas from the uh, volcano came in and people suffocated and died because of that. So, but they found, they found one woman. They, 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 they found her who evidently was rich. They found her in the road, completely preserved pretty much because of the ash. I mean, feet, feet full of ash above her. Maybe she tripped, maybe she just, you know, lost her, her ability to breathe. But what they found on her was all kinds of jewelry and riches. And the excavator surmised that she tried to grasp as much of her jewels and her resources as she could before she headed out of town. And she didn't make it, obviously. What is it that holds holds us, but what is it that we want to hold on to so much in life that keeps us from, well, preparing to get, well, get, get out of town in that scenario, but prepare and be ready for eternity, because eternity hit her within a very brief period of time. I touched on that last week. If you weren't here last week, look about on YouTube and look at that, uh, that rope example that I said there. What are we holding on to that will keep us from grasping eternity? This power of the Holy Spirit to live for God and not just to use God to live for ourselves 
is the difference between life and I would say death. So I want to ask you, do you know of this power that the Bible speaks of for you and for your life? What goal do you have in your life? Is your goals such that when you take your last breath, when you step off this earth into eternity, God welcomes you and says, well done, good and faithful servant. I hope that's your goal. Where is your attention? Day in and day out, where is your attention? Again, from our Bible study this morning, there's this passage from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, be sober-minded. That means be disciplined. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Peter was writing to Christians, remember that. He was writing to all the Christians in what's east, western Turkey today. He roams around, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him firm in your faith. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to close with a prayer, and I'm going to ask Holy Spirit to come and light us up once again. Turn, what, like, what's that? The fire? Did, did, it, did we mention shine, Jesus, shine, the fire? Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire. I'm going to pray that for you and for me, for the church the church because the church needs to go from a little flame to a big a raging flame with love controlled under the power of the holy spirit i'm going to pray that for you and i hope that you'll just say amen to my prayer and you pray this a lot of times a lot of times father god this is your church here this is your body this is these are people that you have redeemed by the blood of christ you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. You have implanted your spirit within the heart of everyone here. And now, Father, now, Father, may, may that flame of your presence be allowed to grow, to grow greater, to grow more visible, to grow more heat, to grow more blessing, not just upon us, of course not for us, but for the church. For the common good, as Paul said in his letter to the Corinthians. Strengthen your church, Father. Strengthen your church. Not just the Solid Rock Church, but your church worldwide. And those who have been, I'll say it, playing church, who have not made a true commitment to you, Lord Christ, have given over their lives to you, have received your forgiveness because you went to the cross, have received your cleansing because they've confessed how much they need you. Those who have not done that or maybe said the words but didn't mean it, Father, that you would help them to understand they need to mean it and that you'll do a mighty work in them and you will raise up your church worldwide. Give us eyes to see how you're doing that now. I believe you are doing that now. I believe you want to do that even more, Father. And those who are watching by video, you do it too. Bend your knee, bend your knee to the Father because he loves you. He sent his son to die for you so that you might live with him for eternity into the fullness of joy where there's no crying or sighing but life everlasting. So come Holy Spirit, convert your church, fill your church with the very present, the power, more power, Father, more authority lived in us, lived through us again. For your glory, Lord Christ. Give us a new Pentecost, Father. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.